Lord's house, and let's begin in a time of prayer. Uh, Brother Chuck, would you lead us in prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we just uh, ask that you bring with Brother Bryce as he uh, brings a message tonight. Lord, Lord, we pray for those that's sick. Lord, we pray those that's ill that cannot make it here tonight. Lord, Lord, we pray, Lord, that uh, reach many even through the internet service. Lord, we pray, Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know you, that tonight would be the night of salvation, Lord. Lord, we just ask for your guidance, Lord, and your precious mercy. Amen.
Amen. It's been a great day in the Lord's house today. It's been a great day. Uh, afterwards, we had a wonderful time. A thank you to the ladies and some of the men of the church and everybody that pitched in for a uh, baby shower for Taylor Johnson and her upcoming uh, baby that's going to be born just in a few weeks and had a great time here. and Just an overwhelming number of gifts and people were uh, so enthusiastic with the support of that and we appreciate it. Uh, we're glad to be back in the Lord's house and had a wonderful sweet time in prayer tonight and in worship and in song and I've been looking forward all day long uh, to hearing what God is going to say to us from Brother Bryce. Uh, he and I had lunch together a couple weeks ago and we're looking at a calendar and and we pointed to this date, and I didn't know this would be an important date uh, for us just because I wouldn't feel like preaching tonight anyway or be able to control and constrain my thoughts. Uh, and so we are so excited that in God's sovereignty, he put this on the calendar this way. And thank you, Brother Heath, for stepping in this morning. And I've heard several people say, where are you, Brother Heath? In the soundboard. You're multi-talented. You, uh, uh, player today moving around different places several people said that's the best sermon brother Heath's ever preached so you're being bragging on today brother Heath a challenging word to us this morning uh, much needed and I know that God is so no no pressure Bryce uh, you know this doesn't have to be that had to be your best ever but bring it okay all right so uh, we're looking forward to what God's going to say through brother Bryce and we love him uh, we have I'm not going to say I watched Heath grow up. I grew up with Heath, but we've watched Bryce grow up, and so uh, we, we're excited about what God's continuing to do in your life. You come ahead and share with us what the Lord's put on your heart this evening. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to see you all today, uh, as it is every week that I get to be with you guys. Uh, this Today is certainly no exception. You all chuckle at the title, I'm sure. Most of you know I very recently got engaged, and I am not ashamed at all to tell you I think about my engagement every single day. It is wonderful. And it's been a very exciting day for a number of reasons, as Wesley has already mentioned. Um, I just, part of the reason I cherish getting to be back so much is that it doesn't matter who stands up in this pulpit, they always mean a great deal to me, and it's always a great refreshment um, to see them open the Word of God and teach out of it. Now, tonight we're going to be doing a little bit different than what I typically do, and I'm excited about it. I think it'll be wonderful. Um, being engaged has been um, a blast. I've been engaged for less than a month now, but it's given me a lot of new perspective on things. As soon as you get engaged, everyone you talk to, they have different things they want to talk to you about, and your family and your relatives and your friends and the people you go to church with, they all have much more important things they want to share and things in their mind, and those are all wonderful, very helpful things. And it might seem silly for someone who's been engaged for all of three weeks to try and talk about being the bride of Christ to a room full of people, most of whom have either already been a bride or have taken a bride and have had one for quite a while. But I don't stand to offer my wisdom or my expertise. And in a certain aspect, not just marriage advice and how that thing goes on forever and you learn more things as you go about, but... What I am very well situated for right now is excitement. And you guys know that Wesley has been rather excited about a grandchild. And as you go through sermons, those things come out. And it's not because, well, you know, people just want to talk about what they want to talk about. I, I truly believe that God uses those moments in us to speak truth when we otherwise wouldn't be paying attention and we wouldn't be focused in on those things. And so today we have three goals. The first one is, I'm going to convince you that you are, in fact, the bride of Christ. The second one is, I'm going to tell you what that looks like. And we're going to give you the crash course on being in a Jewish wedding. And then the third step is, we're going to explain why any of that would matter. And why understanding how you are the bride of Christ lifts a ton of burdens. And how much it can change your life. So, let's get started. You are... The bride of Christ. First things first. It's a little bit of a strange idea. You say, I don't really feel like the bride of Christ. And I don't really think I looked like the bride of Christ when I left my house this morning and looked in the mirror. And trust me, I know I've been in lots of conversations about, well, you, you know, got to make sure we have hair and makeup and wedding dresses and we got to get everything figured out. You think, kind of looks like an ordinary rainy Sunday. Are we sure I'm the bride of Christ? Well, Beyond even that, you might think, Bryce, it's a little strange to start talking about the church and, and a 
Jesus and a marriage. Isn't that kind of weird? The first thing I want to suggest to you is that that imagery and that idea is not new and it's not strange. And it is in the Old Testament. We can trace it a long, long ways. We start reading in Isaiah 62, verse 5. It says, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. God tells Israel, you guys are like my bride. That's how excited I get about you. That's how I relate to you. We don't just get one example of this. The, and we don't also just get one example in the positive. The book of Hosea is about this same imagery. And God says, okay, Hosea, my relationship with Israel is like a married relationship. And right now, it's not a very good one. And for you to demonstrate that to the people, you need to marry an unfaithful wife. Now, the prophets all had to do a lot of really weird, difficult things, but Hosea is up on the top of the list of (laughs) strange, difficult things God asked him to do. But there's this imagery, and God says, listen, the only way Israel's going to understand this is if you live it out for them. But that's the picture of how they're treating me. I don't know, that's kind of weird, that's kind of strange. Jeremiah 3, verse 8, God actually says that he divorces Israel. That he, gave, he put her away with a degree of divorce because she was unfaithful to him. And they go on to describe that Israel is like the bride who despised her jewels and threw away her dress and forgot her husband. So there's this imagery in the Old Testament. The, when Moses gives the law and the Ten Commandments... If you dive into what what happens at a Jewish wedding and what do the Ten Commandments look like, you begin to see that there are all these symbolisms that the Ten Commandment was a marriage gift. It was an engagement ring. And it has all these connections. And and God gave it and betrothed and said, look, this is how our relationship is going to work. This is how it's going to function. Get ready. Prepare yourself. Get used to it. And so there's all this beautiful imagery in the Old Testament. You say, well, Bryce, that's great, but that's... Old Testament nation, Israel, that isn't, we're not the bride of Christ. Well, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, and the former things have passed away. All right. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 32. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Jesus says he cherishes the church. So we see these examples. Matthew 9, 15, and Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. This story is repeated in Mark and Luke as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul says, for I feel a divine jealousy for you. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Paul said, as much as you are my spiritual children, I said, here, I'm arranging this marriage with God. 
You and Jesus, you're going to be the bride of Christ. And he says, I feel responsible to encourage you. Fulfill that commitment. Follow through with that. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that in heaven, there is no getting married. That people who are married now won't be married then. And you think, that's kind of strange. Why is it our wedding vows say, till death do us part? If we're doing things before God and we're going to, God, we're going to be God honoring with them, why do they end at death? Nothing we talk about in the Christian life ends at death. Well, because after death, you're married to someone different. You partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So this marriage that we are looking forward to is a little bit different. It's not to another imperfect person. And there are a few other distinctions that happen as we begin to see and those come to play. But I think we have shown that you are, in fact, the bride of Christ. Not a strange idea, although it might feel like that. It's not unprecedented. It's not a new interpretation. And all throughout the New Testament, there are notes left for us to see, oh, wait, just another way that we're the bride of Christ. Just another way to figure out what this means and what this looks like. All right? Before you go run off and get your makeup done, you're the bride. What does it look like? It's going to be a little bit different. After all, uh, you're marrying a half-Jewish, half-cosmic man. He's not good old country American. Technically speaking, he is 100% God and 100% man, but for the purposes of this, it's going to be a mixed wedding. All right? Um, a few things that will be different. I've been told in all the readings that I do and all the people I talk to that marriages are actually pretty simple. That, you know, you, you commit to them no matter what, and they commit to you no matter what, and that, that's most of it. There are a few other things along the way, but that's most of it. Uh, I will tell you a secret I've learned in the past few days. Weddings are not simple. <laughs> Marriages may be, but weddings are not. And so I'm not just going to say, oh, you're the bride of Christ. Go figure it out. The crash course on Jewish weddings is, is three parts. We'll, we'll boil it down, make it kind of simple. And there are three steps. And the first step is that the groom and your father pick you out, and the bride price is paid. Now we read about a bride price in Genesis where... Jacob says, okay, here, I'll give you seven years hard labor to marry Rebecca. And then he ends up getting married to Leah. And then he says, well, we'll do another seven years for the next one. And King David is approached, uh, King Saul, excuse me, is approached by David. And he says, I would like to marry your daughter, but I'm just a poor farmer boy. What can I do to marry a king's daughter? And you know, Saul says, you know, you go out and clean out a hundred Philistines and we'll call it even. All right, that's the bride price. There was something required. We know about dowries in the world, and people, even in the modern age, have, you know, come to America and have said, wow, you guys just do engagement rings. Back when I come, we pay cows for our wife. All right, so there's this idea of a bride price. It's recorded for us examples in Genesis. It's in the law in Leviticus. Where do we see this in our life as the bride of Christ? What's the first step of your marriage was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We read in Psalms 139, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. From before the moment you were born, Jesus loved you. And he said, God, wow. <laughs> they need to be with us forever. We don't want them to pass away. We don't want them to leave. We don't want anything to keep them apart from us. What, what has to be done? What has to be done so they can be near to us forever? Jesus paid the bride price for you on the cross. He lived a perfect life. It was hard. It was arduous. It took a long time. He died on the cross. And afterwards, it says, we are bought with a price. We're no longer our own. Jesus paid the bride price for us on the cross. Now, the interesting thing about a Jewish wedding is that when your father meets with the, the, man, the groom, they arrange out what the, what the laws will be and the contract and what the price will be. But contrary to most ancient cultures at the time, the bride actually had to sign off on the contract too. The bride had to agree to this whole arrangement. So you might say, well, wait a minute. Jesus paid that bride price a long time before I was even born. Well, the contract is not signed until 
you get in there too and you say, wait, yeah, I want to be united with him forever. That's where I want to be. I want to spend my whole life with him. Now, although the wedding has not yet happened in the way the law is set up in Jewish culture and from the Old Testament, is that from the moment you sign this contract and the bride price is paid, legally, you're married. And to cut it off, you have to get a divorce certificate, right? You don't just break off and engage, well, I didn't really, it didn't really work out. All right, and that's for you to know that even though we haven't gone to the marriage supper of the Lamb yet, Jesus might, isn't just going to wake up one day and call off your engagement. Okay. Legally, those things are connected. You're set in stone. You're paired up. And Jesus is never going to leave, and you aren't going to leave either. Why would you? <laughs> Jesus already knows everything bad, everything terrible you've ever done, everything you're going to do. He knew it long before you were born. He knew it when you picked you out. He said, man. That's the one I want. And we think, okay, great. As long as I just hold it together, he won't realize all the stuff I've done. And if I, if I just walk my line real close, I won't do anything really bad in the future that he'll decide, wait a minute, I made the wrong choice. He already, knew, he already knows all that. He knew it long before. What reason will we have to leave? So the first step is that you get picked out and Jesus pays the bride price. The second step is that the groom leaves. John 14, verses 2 and 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. So the second step in this whole wedding process that you found yourself in is that the, the groom leaves and he prepares a place for you. He's going to go build a house. And we have lots of parables about people who are waiting an unexpected return of a groom. People who have to keep oil in their lamps and they have to be ready and they have to have all their things together. And one might be in the field and caught and one might be left and they're there's all these parables about, are you ready? We don't know when he's coming back. We don't know when he's coming back. And that's rooted in this idea that the groom would go away and no one knew how long it would take. He would build a house and then he would come back. And you just had to be ready. Now, there's a passage that's always been interesting to me. Matthew 24, verse 36 is a common phrase that you're familiar with. It says, but, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. And ever since I was a little kid, I remember scratching my head and thinking, wait a minute, okay, even if you want me to believe I'm the bride of Christ, maybe I can get over that. But how on earth is the Son not supposed to know, but the Father does know? This is the Trinity. What? And this is very clearly an allusion to a Jewish wedding practice. Because the groom goes off and he builds the house. And you think when he's done with the house, he'll come back. The, the wedding will happen. And everyone will be surprised. And you're almost right. But the trick is, the father of the bride has to go and inspect the house and declare it ready. He says, no, no, no. I'm not, getting my, I'm not letting my daughter run off and get married to some craftsman who doesn't know what he's doing. And the house is going to fall in on him. And so it is biblical and it is a common cultural practice that the only person who knows when the wedding will happen is the father. Because he's the one that says, okay, this place that you've prepared, it's right. It's perfect. My child is going to live here. It's good enough for them. And so we know as Christians that that's where we are right now. We are, Jesus is in heaven and he is preparing a place for us. And one day God will say, it's prepared. It's ready for them. Bring them home. This is where they're supposed to be. So we hear that, all right, the groom has left, and we've got the bride, price, the bride price paid. And step three, the final step, is, of course, to be ready for the return of the groom. Revelation 19, 7 and 8 says, The bride is permitted to clothe herself in fine linen, pure and white. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. There are no bridal shops in ancient Israel. 
You don't walk in and pick out a dress and walk home with it. You have to make it. And when the groom leaves and goes to prepare a place for you and you're waiting for him to come back, it's not a sitting around and twiddling your thumbs and hoping it's soon or hoping it's later. You're preparing. You're getting ready. There's not a lot of forward notice on that wedding. And for it to be as wonderful and as enjoyable for you and your family and the people around you as it can, you need to be prepared. And you need to be ready. And you need to have oil in your lamps. And you need to have a dress made. And you need to have the arrangements all set. And the Bible says that the only arrangements we get to carry into heaven in this wedding are the righteous deeds we've done. The things Christ has asked us to do and empowered us to do and we've been obedient to do. And so... You understand now what what happened back then. The bride price was paid for you and you were picked out. And now the groom is away and he's preparing a place and he's going to come back for us. And as we continue to go forward until that day, we will be preparing ourselves and getting ready. Now at school and all our Bible study groups, we do observation, interpretation, and application. The OIA method of Bible study. And it's a very good method. And I only have one problem with it. Well, maybe I have two or three, but one real problem, which is that the words are all way too long. And I tell them that I have a redneck method that's very similar, and it's called what, so what, and now what. And so the what is that you're the bride of Christ. And the so what is, well, this is what happened, and this is what you have to do now going forward or preparing yourself. And the now what is, well, Bryce, why did I even care? What does it matter? And we've belabored all these points and we've worked through and I've, you know, you flip back in your Bibles to look at all sorts of different references because I want you to remember part of the reason I'm doing this message and it works out great that it's on a day that Wesley's grandson is born and, and I'm engaged and you guys remember those things is to remember that you are the bride of Christ. You say, well, Bryce, if I was the bride of Christ, I wouldn't forget it. So my fiance, someday she texts me about that girl I bumped into in third grade. What was, what, what about her? I think, did you forget? You have a ring on your finger. You're the bride. You don't have to be worried about that. And so much of our life as Christians is we forget. We're the bride of Christ. And we're walking around like, well, Jesus is that famous person we met all those years ago at a book signing or a concert. And when someone brings up their name, we go, oh, I know him. I know him. And then when they ask us, well, what does he think about this? And when did you last talk to him? And when do you guys hang out? We think, oh, well, we don't, I don't really know him, though. No, I'm... I just, you know, I just met him once. You're the bride of Christ. And when you remember that, it's going to do three things for you. The first one is that we hear often, all the time, three famous words. Jesus loves you. And so often we read them and we hear them like we are a 14-year-old in the backseat of a car driving down the highway and we look out, and there's an old, dusty billboard, and we're just dejected and down, and we, Jesus loves me. <sighs> so what? <laughs> and when you remember that you were the bride of Christ, no, no, no. You go, Jesus loves me. There's, there's two parts in that, right? There's the, the intonation little way. Jesus doesn't love you. He loves you. And the second one is, you, you know, you get a little head wiggle. You get excited about that. That's something that's special. And as we're Christians for years and years and years, and we hear it and we hear it and we hear it, it just becomes dull. And we just, well, I don't know, what's that whole deal? Is that really all that important? And we've got to remember that you are the bride of Christ. It's exciting that he loves you. And it's exciting when you love him. The second thing that will happen when you remember that you are the bride of Christ is it will encourage you. Because it's a long engagement. Jesus sure seemed to think it was short. He said, don't worry, I'll be back soon. And we're thinking, are you sure? This sure seems like a long time. And you're waiting to go somewhere, waiting to see someone, you know, little kids at Christmas. You think, it's a long time to Christmas. If you ask them on the 22nd, what do they say? Boy, it's a long time to Christmas. You think, it's only three days. But you're looking forward to it, and it feels so long. And so as you remember that you're the bride of Christ, don't get discouraged. Don't get bored. Don't get distracted. Don't forget you're engaged. There's a great wedding, and it's coming. The other great thing to be encouraged about is that, wow, this Christian life is a lot of fun. It's got a lot of great stuff in it, and it is really enjoyable. But it gets better than this. 
I told you, I love being engaged. But I'm excited that this isn't the end. <laughs> I can't wait to get married, right? It gets better than this. And as the bride of Christ, that's what we remember. Hey, this is wonderful, and this is special. And this isn't going to go old and dusty, and I'm not going to forget about it. But this isn't the end either. The third thing that happens when you remember that you are the bride of Christ is it'll do more than just encourage you. I believe it will set you free. The Bible says that's what the truth does. And you truly are the bride of Christ. If we start thinking about the things most people struggle with in their Christian life, it becomes rather apparent that they are all the result of forgetting how he thinks about us, that we're his bride. We worry about all sorts of things. Am I going to be provided for? Loved, healthy, happy? Is what I do going to be meaningful? Does someone notice all the hard work I do? Am I going to be forgotten? Is God listening to me? Does he run out of patience with me? When I ask, does he even care? If I keep asking him, is he going to get bothered and frustrated with me? That's ridiculous. <laughs> You're the bride. He loves you. He spends every moment thinking of you. He cherishes being with you. He listens for your voice every hour. He's always paying attention. He's always making sure you have what you need. He's always thinking of what's best for you. It would be ridiculous to suggest that when you ask things, he isn't listening and he's got half his attention somewhere else. And we feel that way because there's so many other things going on and we, we see human relationships and we base that and we look up and we go, well, that must be what he's like. But it's not. Jesus hasn't forgotten about us. He's not going to forget about us. He doesn't mind when we make requests and when we ask and we, when we draw near. He's proud of the work you do. He's excited for the things that you're doing. And he wants to be a part of it. He wants to hear about it. Sometimes I get, you know, I get frustrated with all these questions about, well, what do you do today? What, how'd you feel? What'd you think? And I think, oh my gosh, why do you got to ask so many questions? And Pastor Mike, he says, you know, Jesus is kind of like your fiance. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, he wants to know about all your thoughts. He wants to be involved in every little thing of your day. He wants to know how that made you feel and what you're going to do about it. He wants to know if you remember this stuff that you did and that thing. And he wants to know if you're still worried about that thing you talked about last week. You are the bride of Christ. Recalling how he thinks of us and how he treats us changes everything. When we stop thinking of Jesus as someone who's detached and someone who's oblique to us and a, maybe kind of an acquaintance, and we realize that when we become Christian, when we, when we sign off on that marriage contract and say, God, I, Jesus, you're the one I want to spend eternity with. You're the one I give everything for. I don't want to chase after anything else. No one else is going to be the God of my life. We become the bride. And I think most of us know that and understand that for about the first five minutes. And then we forget. And we get distracted. And we think, surely not me. He can't be in love with me. I can't do this and I can't do that. And I'm bad at this and I just messed up that one again. And my encouragement to you is to remember that you are. You may not feel like, you may not look like it some mornings, but you are. And the Bible tells us of another person who's involved in this wedding. We get one more example, and it's in John 3. Let's see. John 3, starting at verse 27. I gave 22. 22, there we go. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Aon near Salim because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, 
but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. The final participant in this wedding that we've been talking about is effectively the best man. John the Baptist says, my joy is complete because I watched the groom come and I've watched the bride meet him and I went before and I proclaimed, get ready, repent, the kingdom of God is near. Matthew eleven eleven says that among those born of women on earth, there is no one more blessed than John the Baptist because he came first and he announced there's going to be a wedding. And when the groom comes back, you're going to want to be his bride. And church, in as much as we are the bride of Christ, we also have a great opportunity to be like him. And to say in our joy and excitement that not only does Christ love us far greater than anything we could imagine, but Christ can love you that way too. And our service and the deeds that we do and the preparations we do in this Christian life flow out of that desire that Christ first loved us. That's why we love Him. And when He comes back, you're going to want to be a part of the bride too. Let's bow and pray. God, we thank you so much for your word, for a dry and warm place to meet with your people, to seek your will, God, and to discover your truth. We thank you so much for the powerful image that we might understand in human terms of a wedding, that you are the perfect groom, and you love us more than anything we could ever imagine, God. God, I ask that you would prevent us from getting confused about who we are and thinking that you don't really care about us and living our lives like you're not really that concerned. God, I ask that you would fill us with the certainty that we are your bride, that you think of us every day. You've provided what we need. You're caring for us, God. Would you give us that certainty? And God, I ask that out of that abundance of our heart, that we would go and proclaim great news, that people would pay attention to our excitement. They would want to get in on the good things that you're doing, that they would also want to be a part of the bride of Christ God. May we share the message that you paid the bride price. You loved us long before. You know everything about us that we're hung up about. God, I ask that you give us the strength and the faith to trust in you. And all these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
God's people said amen.